from Chicago Public Radio, this is Odyssey. I'm Gretchen Helfrich. Ethical questions are all around us. How far should doctors go to extend a life? What obligations do accountants have to disclose illegal financial deals? Under what circumstances is an invasion justified? All of us face ethical choices all the time. But how should any of us make these decisions? Do you have a set of rules that you follow? Maybe not the Ten Commandments exactly, but perhaps rules like tell the truth or don't be cruel. At the very least, you might have the golden rule. After all, isn't ethics all about what we do unto others? If we have such rules, do they determine what to do in a situation? Or do they, rather, give us a starting point, a factor to weigh against other considerations? What if we didn't have rules? How would we make ethical decisions then? Well, some people think that such a no-rules approach to ethics is possible, indeed the only correct way to make ethical decisions. What would ethics be like without principles? What would be gained and what would be lost? Today on Odyssey, we are going to explore the pros and cons of ethical principles. Joining us for the conversation are two philosophers. From Baltimore, Maryland, we are joined by Jonathan Dancy. And with us in New York City is Simon Blackburn. Simon Blackburn, let me turn to you to get us started. Explain what is meant by a principles-based approach to ethics. Well, people usually have in mind one of two models, I think. There's either the Ten Commandments model, thou shalt do this, thou shalt not do that. Uh, there's a set of rules or principles, and acting morally consists in following them and not transgressing the boundaries. And that's probably a lot of people's first exposure to ethics as a self-conscious subject uh, in sort of primary school or uh, Sunday school classes. Um, then there's a slightly more elaborate um, attempt to derive principles, uh, which is usually associated with the name of Immanuel Kant, the great German philosopher, who thought that a, a fairly simple formula uh, along the lines of the golden rule um, enabled you to deduce that there were certain things you just must not, not do. There were certain kinds of action which were prohibited. So the net result was something like a Ten Commandments morality, but it didn't have a theological backing. It had a backing, Kant thought, in pure reason. And so, um, go ahead. Yeah. No, 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 that's... That, that, that's okay, well, what I was going to ask is, so then what does ethical decision-making look like um, in a system like that? Well, it looks, unfortunately, rather simply, rather too simple and rather too easy. Uh, you just look up in your book of rules where the boundaries are and you don't transgress them. Uh, it's probably how we think of something like uh, um, don't steal. Um, you know, if you find that it's a case of stealing, then you turn your back on it. And ethical decision making is just a matter of having internalized those boundaries. So there's some things you just couldn't do, you wouldn't do. Um, don't, uh, uh, you know, uh, lust after other people's wives or don't steal or don't tell lies, don't break promises. Um, so that's the very simple model of a principle-based approach or rule-based approach to ethics. Um, but then, unfortunately, that doesn't really work. It's not adequate to the complexities of human life. So anybody who still wants to think in terms of principles has to start adding some complexity. For example, for when principles clash, del deliver two different verdicts. Um, you've got to keep the promise, uh, but keeping the promise means uh, uh, breaking the appointment. So you can't both have the principle of always keeping promises and always keeping appointments. Uh, and when principles clash, you need some sort of uh, adjustment, some kind of subtlety, uh, some sort of judgment steps in. Well, um, th that second model where you have a set of principles, but you qualify them and you apply them um, differently mm. under different circumstances, right. that sounds a lot like what a lot of us do when we make ethical decisions. It doesn't sound completely alien. Jonathan Dancy, um, I'm wondering what it would look like to make decisions without principles. Yes, well, that's in a way my question, I think. Uh, if you, you look at the story, the principal story, how, how you're supposed to approach situations as you come across them and respond to them, um, and you're supposed to apply or in some way connect your principal to the present case. Now, what I want to know really is what happens if you take the principles out of the equation and what would be lost? And there are two sorts of things you might think you lose. One is 
that without the principles you simply couldn't make any decision at all. The principles are absolutely necessary. And the other is that though without the principles you could make some sort of decision, you'd be much less likely to stick to it or you'd get involved in special pleading, you'd, since your moral judgment would be insecure. And so um, you, might not, you might be less likely to do the right thing or, to, or perhaps also less likely to spot it. So principles My give you a sort of it, backbone. Yeah, it sort of toughens the spine, sinews, or whatever. Um, my view is that you don't need the principles to make these judgments, and that um, once the judgments are made, having the principles doesn't um, much help you stick to them either. Okay, we're going to talk more about the, the pros and cons, advantages and disadvantages of, of having principles, but Jonathan Dancy, let me ask you to be more specific. How do you think judgments get made in the absence of principles? Well, it's... I mean, I th if you think of an ordinary situation when you're faced with a difficult, or not, not even a particularly difficult moral decision, um, obviously all of us have to consider the nature of the situation in, in pick out which features of it are relevant and which are not, and try and work out how separately and together they affect how you should act, and then you come to a decision in the light of all that. Now, I maintain that we are perfectly competent of doing all that, and that inserting principles into the equation um, is not only an unnecessary, but in fact a slightly awkward and um, interruption that could lead you astray. Well, so what kinds of, where do you start, in other words? Um, where do you start okay. making a decision? I mean, it seems to me that the idea of the principles is that that's where you start evaluating the situation to, to decide what your judgment is going to be. If you don't have principles, where do you start? Well, you start with the reasons. The, according to me, there are features that are reasons in favor of one action, others in favor of another, some in favor of doing the first action but in a rather different way, and so on. And that all these reasons are things we're capable of discerning. And once we've discerned the reasons, we're capable of um, putting them together in such a way as to work out what to do. The principles play no role in this whatever. I don't see how principles really could help. To make the decision. Yeah, I mean, the decision essentially is a response to, to the particularities of the situation. Okay. Simon Blackburn. Yes, I think what people, uh, where people have trouble quite understanding Jonathan's position um, is um, what he's calling reasons, um, which can be discerned, as he, as he puts it, in advance, are very close to what in practice people think of as principles. I mean, let, let me give an example. Um, suppose we promise on Saturday to go and visit grandmother, um, but then we realize there's a home game and the children would like to go and see the home game. Well, we know in advance that it's, as it were, an obstacle. It counts against going to see the game that we promised we'd go and see grandmother. We don't like the idea of breaking a promise. So the promise is acting as a kind of what Jonathan would call a reason um, other people might say it's a principle, and, they, and you could hear people saying it's a principle with me not to make, break my promises, and that settles it, and so on. Um, but uh, for less uh, for less inflexible people, for more for more flexible people, the principle might take its place as one factor, an important factor, perhaps even an overriding factor. So I think what I would think of as overriding factors things which we take very seriously, are quite close to what Jonathan's calling reasons, which he admits. So I think the difficulty is seeing exactly where he stands on the difference between reasons which he admits and principles which he dislikes. Let me ask you, Jonathan Dancy, where you stand on that, but first let me remind folks that they are listening to Odyssey from Chicago Public Radio. Our conversation today is about ethics and whether ethics ought to be grounded in principles or whether there's a better way to go about things. So, Jonathan Dancy, what is the difference between a reason and a principle as you see it? Okay, well, I think, I mean, the, the curious way I can, say, I can find to say this is to say that a principle specifies an invariant reason, something that's always a reason wherever it pops up. And the promising case is a good one. Many people think that if you have promised, that's always some reason at least to keep your promise, even if there might be more reason not to in a particular case. So here we have something that wherever it uh, occurs plays the same role, the reason giving role. And then there will be variant reasons, that's to say features that are sometimes reasons and sometimes aren't reasons at all, or are reasons on the other side even. And they of course won't be specified in principles. Can you give me an example? Of a variant reason? Yeah. Um, 
Well, uh, what should we say? Um, that you did it to me last time. Wait, that just sounds to me like a bad reason. Is that a good? When would that be a good Some, reason? Sometimes it's a good reason. Uh, perhaps you. Last time, I asked I asked you for money. You lent it to me. Mm -hmm. So that's a reason for me to lend it to you this time. Okay, so that's a reason that counts in favor in this situation. Yeah, but it might count against in others. Okay. But what you said before about promising um, mm -hmm. that, that it might be an invariant reason? Yes. I, well, I, I, I mean, I, I think most people... Sorry. Well, I just don't see how that's different from it being a principle. <laughs> exactly not. That was the, my point. That okay. The, 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 as Simon is presenting the, the position at the moment, there are things... Well, actually, he put things we especially care about. I think something like that. Um, but that, I'm reading that at the moment as things that we take always to count. They may not count very much, actually, but, but then there'll be ones that do count a lot. Mm -hmm. But the, you know, the print promising isn't such a big deal, perhaps, in many cases. Um, those ones, you might say, are capturable in principles, which specify as reasons something that's always a reason. So it's a, like um, a, a general principle. Mm -hmm. Then there'll be the, re the like, reasons that can't be captured in principles because their behavior isn't regular enough. Okay. And like, ones, like considerations like you did it to me last time. Yeah. I okay. Mean, um, now those can still be relevant, but their behavior can't be captured in principles. Okay. So is it your contention then, Jonathan Dancy, that there are that that we shouldn't assume there's anything that we will always take to count in a particular way in every situation? Um, I do think that, but it's slightly stronger than that. I mean, I think, you know, I think in the promising case, myself, I, I think that sometimes the fact that you promised uh, is no reason to do the action at all. So that's just about that particular example. Can you give me an example? Um, well, um, um, what if your promise was extracted from you by duress? Okay. Or by deceit? Uh, what if what you promised to do was something essentially immoral? Okay. Then um, the fact that you promised it shouldn't count at all. I think in those cases it doesn't count at all. It's and, and you're not saying it's outweighed by the fact that you promised to that's, do something immoral. It just doesn't count. Exactly. Yeah, it's as it were wiped out as a reason. Mm -hmm. But I mean that's about the particular case. More to the point, really, from my, uh, as I see it, is the question whether morality, if it would collapse if there wasn't a sufficient supply of invariant reasons specified in principles. And you think it would? I not. don't think the. I think not. I think that invariability, where you can find it, is no doubt. You know, helpful and particularly helpful when you've got difficult decisions. If you, as long as you know about the invariability, that it, you know this thing always does function the same way. Simon Blackburn, let us for a moment set aside the question about whether uh, we have whether principles are right or not, and let's ask the question about what happens if we don't have them. In other words, what are the sort of secondary gains of having? a system of principles. You started to talk about some earlier, but let's lay them out a little more. Well, the, I think the, the first and foremost advantage that people who insist on principles like to stress is that they enable us to know where we stand. If you have a set of boundaries on, on conduct, things which people mustn't do, and you can expect them to have internalized that, uh, then you know in that respect where they say, where you stand. You've got uh, every right to expect them you know, to, for example, respect your property. Uh, and if they don't, they've transgressed in your eyes and ought to have transgressed in their, their own eyes, and perhaps in society's eyes, if we can agree on a set of principles. So principles, I think, you know, they've got the advantage of stability. I think the difficulty people have with Jonathan's variations, uh, the, the denial that there are invariant reasons for doing one thing or another, is that such a, such a, such a variable ethic might seem to take away the kind of expectations, the kind of certainty we have. Um, suppose I'm, to, to revert to my example of promising uh, grandma that we go and visit her, um, I think the fear is that if she knows that my thinking, say on Friday before the game, is going to be highly contextualized and the fact that I've given her a promise might suddenly, as it were, disappear into nothingness, not even count as a reason, or actually count as a reason for not going to see her, 
then of her, course her confidence in my promise keeping and her right to feel aggrieved if I break my promise uh, all seem to have evaporated. So I think what Jonathan needs to do is show that a, 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 a system of ethics which permits those variations can nevertheless do the job of social coordination which um, many people see as the fundamental role of ethics. Hold on, Jonathan Dancy, because I want to hear from you, but I want to clarify and see if I understand the point you're making, Simon Blackburn. Sure. You're saying that in the absence of a commonly understood and commonly shared principle that promises should be kept, then your very act of making a promise doesn't have any meaning. Well, that would be the, the Maybe you'll collapse. show up, maybe, you'll, maybe you won't show up. Grandma doesn't know what to do with Friday afternoon. That's exactly right. That, that's the final collapse mm -hmm. um, that, as it were, by, by making a promise, um, you, you, you actually begin to fail to give other people the expectation or the right to expect uh, that you're about to do what you said you'd do. Um, All and, right. and, and at that point, of course, the whole institution of promising breaks down. Now, I know Jonathan's far too sensitive to, to anticipate that <laughs> breakdown, <laughs> but, I'm, but I'm putting it to him as a problem that his particularist approach has to address because it is the the main motivation I think for people almost emotionally seizing hold of principles as the uh, the cornerstone of social living and social expectations social behavior Jonathan Dancy how do we rescue mm. grandma <laughs> well I think grandma can rely on you by and large to do the right thing effectively um, and that well look at it, look at it like this there are since we had two people you know one particularist who's um, pronouncing, as you say, that they are going to look at each situation in its rich particularity, and the other, the rule follower, um, who is sort of tying themselves to the promising rule, at least. And now we want to know who's going to be the most predictable. Or well, one thing we, I mean, allow that both of them are judging well. Okay, uh, that they're not too so easy. Case, then I think it's easy. The particularist will keep the promise where where sh she should and not where she shouldn't. And grandma, if you like, wouldn't need to expect the particularist to keep the promise where she shouldn't. And you want you to do it when you should. Mm -hmm. Now that's perfectly sufficient, um, I would have ordinarily thought, um, to keep grandma happy and to make us happy when we walk along the street that people aren't going to leap upon us with an ax. That, well, I guess, the, okay, the question is this. Um, what is the case where you should? On the principal account, the case where you should is the case where you made the promise, period, end of story, or, or almost end of story. Um, in the particularist yeah. case, what is to be? what are we to understand by those cases where you should, if having made the promise isn't in and of itself the should? Well, actually, what I think about this is that um, there are such things as default reasons, as I say, considerations that give you a reason unless something stops them. And promising might be like that. So once you've promised, then unless something gets in the way, you should act or you have some reason to act. Now that's some kind of a sop to Granny. <laughs> <laughs> Can we treat Granny a little better here? <laughs> well, okay, perhaps I shouldn't. Well, anyway, you, um, that should keep. Granny would know that you would c turn up unless there was good reason not to, and the good reason would have to be good enough to defeat the promise, mm -hmm. and not only just to defeat it, perhaps or. I mean, it may turn out, well, you can see what I mean. The point is that there's something set up in advance. So in itself, as you put it, you, one might say the promise is a reason, gives you a reason to do the promised act. But in certain circumstances, its ability to do that is taken away from it. Simon Blackburn, what do you think of that response? I think it's a very good response. I, mean, I think it's the best possible response for Jonathan. And, and in fact, I don't stand a million miles from him on that because I too believe in considerable practical flexibility. Um, I mean, famously, Immanuel Kant said that you had to um, uh, had to tell the truth regardless of whether the person you were talking to was intent on using the truth to commit crime, to kill your children. Uh, the famous example was the mad axeman asks you where your children are and you have to say where they are, even although that uh, predictably leads him to them. Um, I don't think any philosophers, I, I, I don't know of any, certainly no brand name philosophers, who followed Kant in that and it was regarded as a sort of piece of madness, even in his own day. So once Jonathan gives default reasons due weight, then I think he's he's coming much closer into line with the the bulk of moral theory uh, since Kant's time. Uh, and the enemy now just looks like totally inflexible, 
uh, uh, principles, principles which, as it were, nobody in their right mind would stick to. Um, I think in my book I give the example of, uh, uh, it's actually a humorous example from the humorous beachcomber of the Englishman who's on, on the brink of starving to death in the foreign country because he can't dress for dinner since his dress clothes have disappeared. And uh, that's the kind of principle that we can well do without. <laughs> um, but the danger, the worry is that some of Jonathan's language leads us to uh, believe in a much sort of much greater melange in which various practical considerations always get to jostle. And I don't think he allays people's fears just by saying, well, people uh, will do what they should, um, and what they should is, uh, is is stable enough and predictable enough to, uh, to, to give us the social function of morality. Because in the absence of reasons having at least default power and often considerable power, nobody knows where those shoulds come from. Uh, and that's, I think, a difficulty which uh, Jonathan's work sometimes uh, seems to, 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 uh, to incite. It's a, it's a problem that uh, causes people like me. Well, I have many more questions about this, but let me first let folks know that we are going to take some calls a little later in the program. And our number is one eight eight eight. 859-1800. It's a toll-free number anywhere in the U.S., so give us a call if you'd like to join in our conversation. We are talking today about ethics and whether they should be grounded in rules, principles, or whether there's another approach. Uh, we're joined by Simon Blackburn, a philosopher at Cambridge University in Cambridge, England. He's the author, most recently, of Being Good. He's joining us from New York City. In Baltimore, Maryland, we're talking with Jonathan Dancy. Dancy's a philosopher at the University of Reading in Reading, England, and his forthcoming book is Ethics Without Principles. Jonathan Dancy, I want to ask you a, a, another sort of social question. Um, Simon Blackburn's main concerns about your approach seem to be on the social level. My question is this. On a particularist approach, a particularist being the approach that you're talking about, um, what is it that people might share in common? Um, it, it's clear to me, if you're talking about principles, that you could at least say, here's a principle and it applies to all of us. It's much less clear to me how people might have a shared ethical system or whether that matters. Okay, well, first, of course, it wouldn't be a system for me. Okay. It would be a sort of nuanced outlook, uh, a way of taking things to account, a, a, you know, a way of being sensitive uh, a shared way of being sensitive to the sorts of demands that the world we live in throws up. So there's plenty to share there. The question is whether I can give a decent account of what it is that's shared. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Now, I maintain something like this, that um, one can... Firstly, we can learn from each other which things matter. So there is a kind of mutual education in which we learn from our parents initially and then from our friends and from our family. We're always learning new things about the way, ways in which things matter. But this can be common knowledge. It needn't be private and peculiar to oneself. One can get it from others and one can transmit it to others. So this is just like other knowledge in that kind of way. There should be no reason of, for supposing that in the absence of principles, we're all locked inside some kind of private box, desperately trying to make decisions. Okay, so th this, this is actually something I really wanted to get clear on. This is not a system, or, or your view is not, well, I have my views and you have your views. It's a system that says, it, it's not about um, particularity across people, it's particularity across cases. That's right. There's, no, there's nothing wrong with general moral knowledge. I mean, I know that generally um, it's a reason not to do something to someone that they don't want you to do them. Um, and they have, you know, and so on. That, that, that's generally a reason. This kind of general knowledge is gained from experience and reinforced case after case. Okay. Um, Your objection is with saying that tells you something specific or dispositive about how you ought to act in a given case. Is uh, that right? That generality does not right. determine what is the case, it, what, what's, what, how things are in the new case. No, I mean, just like the fact that... Um, you know, adult uh, grown boys are, off, are normally taller than grown girls doesn't te sort of make this new boy taller than this new girl. Okay. Um, Simon Blackburn, yes. what difference what, it, what difference does it make whether our, 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 our judgments are grounded in principles or not if they come out largely the same? And the way the two of you have been talking today, judgments in particular cases 
are, are going to come out mostly the same, or 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 there's going to be tremendous overlap at the very least. It's not as if Jonathan Dancy is saying, "Yeehaw, it's a free for all. You can do whatever you want." Um, he's still talking about ethical people making ethical judgments and largely doing the right thing. So, what difference does it make? Well, possibly rather little by the time we get here. I mean, a, a, an obvious analogy is with law. Um, lawyers are very familiar with cases where, uh, quotes, principles uh, clash, they uh, get overridden, they fail to apply to particular cases, it's not as simple as you think, and so on. Um, nevertheless, it seems strange and sort of you come on as all fire-breathing and radical if you say the law has no principles. And it sounds as though that just means anything goes and there's no stability and you can't rely on the law and so on. Um, by the time you've got what Jonathan calls default reasons, you've got reasons that need to be overridden unless they're to dispose of a case, if they're not to dispose of a case, then of course you're getting back quite a lot of the stability and the uh, knowing where we stand, uh, which the law uh, insists upon and needs to, to function as an institution. Um, and similarly for ethics. So in fact, the uh, what I think of as the fire-breathing side, the side that is supposed to make a, a great deal of difference, may may start to diminish, and, and in fact, it may start to evaporate. If I could just pick up what Jonathan said about education, mm -hmm. I mean, I too share the view, which I, I derive from, uh, from the great 18th century Scottish philosopher David Hume and, uh, and his uh, follower Adam Smith, that uh, ethical education is largely a matter of training in sensitivities. And those sensitivities can be very, very particular, as Jonathan has it. Um, I don't like putting it in terms of moral knowledge, but that may not matter for the for the purpose of this issue. I prefer to put it in terms of a training in the virtues. And the virtuous person has indeed learnt, learnt a sensitivity to many, many different and many, many complex cases. So in practice, it may seem it may matter less than it sounds when it comes on as uh, so very radical and very sceptical. But my assessment of the importance may not be quite the same as Jonathan's. <laughs> uh, mm. You are listening to Odyssey from Chicago Public Radio, and our conversation today is about ethics and principles and why we might or might not want to ground ethics in principles, in rules. Jonathan Dancy, um, let me ask you a slightly different question. On a particularist view of things, um, where does the law stand? I mean, the law tells you what you're supposed to do in a particular case um, ahead of time, often without looking at much of the complexity of a situation. Um, does that present a problem? Well, I didn't think so. I mean, there are, firstly, there's two sorts of law, the statute law and case law. Uh, the, the, as far as the statutes go, there need to be, obviously, um, things that can be promulgated in advance, and they're going to be no, 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 no doubt very complicated nowadays. Um, still, they'll have their limitations. Um, now, as far as I can see, that doesn't affect what I say about reasons in general. It, it affects the way that laws. Ha it, it reflects the way that laws have to work. And um, if we're going to have statutes at all, that's what's going to happen. And the other, but you could have law. That is merely case law, effectively, where the cases are argued by their similarity or difference from previous decisions, and that would be very amenable to a particularist. So, in other words, you take the, you'd look at the similar cases and how they've been decided, and that would be pretty important information to have in a new case, but wouldn't be the end of the story. Well, I mean, in, in, in case law, as I understand it, the arguments take place largely by citing precedents, and um, to the extent, I mean, you can have precedents on both sides, and that's what the lawyers do. And then the judge has to decide um, which, you know, to what extent the present case resembles some previous one where a decision is already made. Now, that's very like, as I see it, um, ordinary moral decision made by somebody with a rich moral experience. But Gretchen, can, mm -hmm. I, can I just sure, come in on that one? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, um, I think that's all very well, but take, take an example of a law, I mean, a very simple law, say, don't shoot red lights. Um, good, good traffic law. Does that mean now, don't run red lights? Oh, don't run red lights. Okay. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> vocabulary difference. Um, don't I'm like, run who wants lights. to shoot at red lights? <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes, that, that would mean something different in this country. Wouldn't it? <laughs> okay, don't run red lights. Um, now, anybody in their right mind knows that um, there might be a circumstance in which it's perfectly legitimate, uh, at least ethically, to to run a red light. 
if uh, you're going down the country highway in the middle of the night and you're being pursued by some chap who's who are genuinely shooting at you, um, <laughs> it might be very sensible to run the red light in order to, to facilita facilitate your escape. Nevertheless, if the cop stops you, um, you'll be deemed to have broken the law, and it, there'll be possibly only a token fine, but there'll be some kind of uh, penalty. In other words, it's not that the reason disappeared. It's not that the fact that it was running a red light suddenly stops having any um, meaning. Um, it's rather the reason's still there, and there may be a penalty or something, and if you've internalized it, you'll say, well, it was a pity about that situation that I had to, ru to run the red light. Uh, it's not as if the reasoning's gone away entirely because of the context. So I want to agree with Jonathan that context matters. Um, I want to disagree, as it were, with the vocabulary that suggests that all the reasons suddenly change their face. Or Simon Blackburn, some... we need to take a break. Yes, so of course you do. So when we come okay. back, we'll continue talking. We'll take some calls at one 859 1800 Stay with us. I'm Gretchen Helfrich, and you're listening to Odyssey from Chicago Public Radio. Welcome back to Odyssey from Chicago Public Radio. I'm Gretchen Helfrich. Our conversation today is about ethics and whether we think ethics ought to be grounded in principles, whether we need general principles that we apply in all cases, or whether there's a different way to go in thinking about ethics and the kinds of things we think of as ethical rules. Our guests are Simon Blackburn, a philosopher at Cambridge University in Cambridge, England. He is the author, most recently, of Being Good, and he joins us from New York City. With us in Baltimore, Maryland, is Jonathan Dancy. Dancy's a philosopher at the University of Reading and the author of a forthcoming book called Ethics Without Principles. Our number one more time is 1-888-859-1800. Let's take a call. Let's talk with Steve. Hi, Steve. You're on Odyssey. Hi. Uh, yeah, my question is about grounding. Um, if there are, if we live in a mechanical universe with completely contingent conditions, uh, why should I care about what happens to society, which apparently is the only uh, groundwork you've really offered so far? Without a metaphysical background, what good are ethics to me personally? Okay, Jonathan Dancy, I'm going to put that question to you because um, I'm going to ask you to clarify the difference between particularism and this kind of contingency that Steve is worried about. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, the contingency he's worried about seems to be the lack of a metaphysical grounding for the demands of morality, um, if I got it right. Mm -hmm. uh, and he offered one that, you know, w w such a, where one might look for such a grounding and maintain that looking for it in society isn't going to be the right way. Now, I, mean, I think I agree that there needs to be a metaphysical base. Uh, that's to say, there must be things that make it the case that one ought to behave one way rather than another. The question is what we're getting, willing to allow uh, as capable of doing that role, playing that role. Um, now, I think things like the needs of others, um, all the commitments I have given, are perfectly capable of making a difference to how I should act. And that there's no mystery about this. It doesn't need to be like grounded on anything um, more solid, if you like, and so you know, I, I would maintain I, there is a metaphysics. There's a, there's a story of where the demands come from, but it's not the metaphysics that Steve wants to give. And that those demands, again, we're, we're, we're those demands don't turn out to be principles. Well, the demands. It's, you know, it's what gives the demands. Mm -hmm. This is what we're looking at. And the question was about grounds, right. which I think is, where does it come from? Um, now, I think that there's nothing very grand about the way in which um, demands arise for us. You, you know, you're walking on the street and there's someone, you know, falls over and breaks their leg. There's a demand. Mm -hmm. what um, are, so what are the things we should care about? You don't think that it's very mysterious to see where those come from? Um, the ground, I think, is fairly, you know, metaphysically not, not very, yeah, exciting. Um, the things we should care about, one can give nothing other than a long and vague list. Simon Blackburn. Yes, I think, um, I think there may be an aspect of Steve's question Jonathan hasn't touched, although I agree with what he's said, um, which is, uh, it can seem rather amazing, that as human beings we're capable of going beyond 
uh, rather narrow and perhaps sometimes rather grubby self-interest and of absorbing the needs of others as factors that are of concern, that matter to us, or equally that we can absorb uh, and internalise um, principles, whether they're hard, solid, sort of Ten Commandment principles or more soft and flexible and, and contextual principles. Um, I think what Steve's wrong about is looking for a metaphysical answer to that. What it really is, is a question of what, what's really going on is a question of psychology, and it just so happens we're capable of uh, absorbing those concerns. Uh, in a way that perhaps other creatures aren't. Although, of course, even a dog can learn to obey elementary rules. Well, those both of those answers raise a million other questions that I don't think we'll yes, be able do. to address <laughs> in this program. Um, but luckily, we get to do the show every day. Let's take some more calls. Our number is one eight 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 five nine one eight zero zero. Let's take a call from Ben. Hello, Ben. You're on Odyssey. Hi. How are you all? Fine, thanks. You know, what's troubling about this whole conversation is that this isn't just a cute intellectual debate. The, the history of the 20th century is littered with the dead and murdered as a result of totalitarianism. And ethical relativism is an intellectual justification in the end for totalitarianism. The simple fact is, is that you have to have principles. Some principles are better than other principles. And in the absence of principles, you can justify anything. I mean, when my kids complain about going to Hebrew school, my explanation to them is, is any decision can be rationalized. You have to have some ethical basis for having made that decision and some set of principles upon which that decision is going to be made. I guarantee you, if the Nazis had won World War II, they would justify the murder of six, of six million Jews on some ethical basis. Jonathan Dancy, is it true that in the absence of principles, anything can be justified? No, of course it's not. It's the in the absence of reasons, anything can be justified, but then, of course, nothing could be justified either. The, the principles, unfortunately, are a double-edged sword. If the Nazis had won the war, they would have justified these things by appeal to some principle or other. And this wouldn't have cut much ice, as far as I was concerned. But those who think that principles have magic powers would be impressed. Simon Blackburn? Well, I quite agree with Jonathan there. I mean, I think the... The, the caller is, is wrong to think that the absence of principles means anything goes, as, as we've been trying to explain. I agree with him, it's a serious matter. This is not a parlour game. The question of how we conduct our practical reasoning is the question of how we live and what our identities become. Um, but you've got to remember that people justify the most awful things in the name of principle. Uh, the principle of the superiority of the Aryan race was one of them. Uh, mm -hmm. the, problem with the, the problem with the Nazis wasn't the lack of principles, it was the wrong principles. Okay, so yeah, that's what I was just going to ask, so the, the principles, the, the, the issue of principles, in and of itself having principles doesn't tell you that the principles are right. Absolutely not, you can do the most awful things in the name of principle. The Inquisition, the, the Stalinism, the Nazism, uh, all of them were highly principled. Okay. Gretchen, can I say sure. a bit more? Yeah. I mean, I just wanted to, to stress again, if possible, that um, I don't conceive of myself as undermining morality, but as trying to no. strengthen it. And, um, you, and you would not see yourself as an ethical relativist? No, no, there's nothing... I mean, if I were an ethical relativist, I'd still be saying the same things. Um, but <laughs> I'm not. As I say, the, the two things would be different. I mean, it, uh, the, the question whether reasons are relative is a you know, the question whether a relativism about, about reasons is true. That would be another issue. Um, but as, as far as this goes, you know, Absolutely right. These are uh, and there's the intellectual debate, and then there are the serious questions. But the, and since you you couldn't be interested in the intellectual debate unless you had the serious questions right in the forefront of your mind. Okay, so in other words, the absence of principles doesn't mean that you, there isn't a right answer in a given case. There's still a right answer. It's a question of how you figure out what that right answer is. Effectively, yes. Though so that's slightly metaphysically put, but they, no, that's right. The absence of principles is, in my view perfectly compatible with there being an answer to the question which way you should go. All right, let's let's uh, let's take another call. Let's talk with Dwayne. Hello, Dwayne. You're on Odyssey. Uh, good, good afternoon. My question uh, is, uh, does the venue in which the ethical judgment is being made uh, change how your standards might apply or principles might apply? Uh, dealing with the grandmother is one thing. Dealing with a business where there's a large part of the population relying on your answer or relying on your judgments uh, is, is obviously a, a different different group. Does the principle vary? Simon Blackburn. Um, that's a difficult one. Um, 
I mean, part of the problem is I don't think it varies with scale. Um, uh, as you probably know, just at present, the British government is in tremendous trouble for having uh, most probably lied to the British public about the reasons for going to war. Um, and people find it very simple to judge that if indeed they did lie, then heads ought to ought to roll. It's an unforgivable um, thing to have done. Um, I don't think scale, you know, the fact that it was very important that, and that many people's lives hinged on it actually makes as much different as, a difference as, uh, as people might think. Um, but, of course, uh, um, any government will have its, uh, have its defences mounted that either it wasn't a lie or it was uh, justified in the interests of a higher good and so on and so on. So, no, I don't think that, um, I don't think that the, the, the scale of the decision makes very much difference. But the nature of the decision may be very contextual, as Jonathan is saying. You're listening to Odyssey from Chicago Public Radio. Our conversation today is about ethics and principles, why we might or might not want to ground our ethics in principles. Let's take another call. Let's talk with David. Hello, David. You're on Odyssey. Yeah, hi. Um, the question I have uh, has to do with uh, this notion of uh, a universal morality and uh, the dangers that that uh, poses. And I, uh, you know, I, it, it just seems to me that once we, um, you know, begin to uh, emphasize a certain set of morals, uh, then that can, <clears throat> excuse me, that can uh, pose some dangers. And I sort of, I think. Uh, your guests have already touched on this, but uh, if, if they could just uh, sort of talk more about this. Uh, now, when you say a universal set of morals, what do you mean? Um, you know, for instance, uh, sort of the Kantian notion of a, uh, sort of a uh, you know set of principles that we all need to follow. Um, and you know, times have changed, and uh, that doesn't mean that morality necessarily changes. Uh, but at the same time, there are certain things that once you begin to apply uh, a certain uh, standard set of morals, uh, then, you know, for instance, uh, you know, Christian morality may uh, have higher uh, moral value than, uh, let's say, a Buddhist, uh, um, you know, set of uh, morals. Simon Blackburn, let me hear your response to that. Well, I think my response has to be quite general. Um, I think that the whole issue of absolutism versus relativism does prey on people's minds. It bothers people. And I think emotionally it attracts a, 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 you know, a great deal of heat. Uh, I think more heat than light, I'd like to say. Um, it's not, I think, universality in the sense of hoping that everybody agrees with you, because I think that's often a vain hope. People are are corrupted by religions and uh, ideologies, so they won't all agree. Um, that doesn't matter. What matters is that you have a, um, a, a moderately worked out, Jonathan doesn't like system, but I think something of the nature of a system of attitudes and responses to the world, which you can justify to yourself and sufficient other people whose opinion you care about to make it stable. Um, after that, relativism doesn't worry me very much. Um, and just to repeat what we've already said, absolutists can be just as dangerous, and in fact, sometimes more so. It's when you think you're in the right that you think you've got the, jo the justification for doing the most awful things. So I, I worry about absolutism in human history, actually more than I worry about relativism is sort of tolerant, happy, clappy, anything goes. And that's actually often not a bad attitude for people to have. <laughs> Jonathan Dancy, <laughs> are you happy, clappy? <laughs> Mm. I mean, it depends what a relativism is here, but mm -hmm. the, the idea, I mean, one question is, would it be best if we all had the same general moral outlooks, or is it positively good that there are many moral outlooks in the world? Um, I'm certainly not, a, it's not clear to me that it would be better if there was only one. Uh, one can celebrate diversity in all sorts of ways mm -hmm. without feeling that one's own position is thereby threatened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't, the, I, the, the, uh, I don't, you know, if we said we must impose a morality and it will be ours, that would be dreadful. Mm -hmm. If we said um, we must at all costs cease to disagree in any significant moral way, I would think that probably it's better to continue disagreeing. So we just have a couple of minutes left. Um, let me ask, let's sort of go back to our, our basic question. Actually, a slightly different version of our basic question. Simon Blackburn, what do you think it is that most people do when they make ethical decisions? What do you think is their relationship to principles? 
Well, I think the relationship, to, it'll depend on the case. I mean, some cases are straightforward. If, uh, I don't know, if I'm a guest in the friend's house and he's left some loose change lying on the, 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 the table, it doesn't even occur to me to take it. Um, you know, my behavior is absolutely bounded by the, the sanctity of that relationship and that, uh, that situation. Uh, in that sense, I can be said to be a person of principle. Now, it's not that I actually thought ah, I have a principle that says I mustn't take property, especially when I'm a guest. Um, <laughs> that, that's I'm very unlikely to have thought that. It's just I don't do it. And I think many of our, many of our decisions are far more automatic, they're in a sense made for us by our habits of upbringing, um, than, than we like to think. Inevitably, it's the ones that aren't automatic that occupy the center of our consciousness because those are the ones that are difficult and that, that we are the most challenging. Need, need to think about. Mm -hmm. The Simon, automatic ones tend to get lost in the background. Simon Blackburn. There are many, many of them. <laughs> Simon Blackburn <laughs> is a philosopher at Cambridge University in Cambridge, England. His latest book is Being Good. Jonathan Dancy, same question for you, but we just have about 30 seconds. Um, well, I mean, I think that the way the the way the, the the like morality itself operates is quite different from the way any particular person might think. We, I, I myself think in terms of what sound like principles, despite my best efforts to stop it. <laughs> um, I did at one point when I was head of department try to have a rule that no appeal to principles should be made during departmental meetings. And then they said, you can't have a rule. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no, this was a, a philosophical rule, right. Um, um, the fact was that we managed perfectly well, but we had to sort of rethink our arguments. And I, so what I think about this is that many people, you know, diff pe different people approach the same question in different ways, they approach different questions in the same way, and so on. Um, We've been trained culturally to think in terms of principles, and people do sometimes approach cases with principles in mind. But that doesn't really affect what I think of as the basic issues here. Jonathan Dancy is a philosopher at the University of Reading. He's the author of a forthcoming book called Ethics Without Principles. Jonathan Dancy and Simon Blackburn, thank you both very much for joining me today. Thank, thank you, Gretchen. Thanks also to everyone for listening and for calling. Odyssey's theme music was composed and performed by OK Go. Thanks to our research assistant, James Lyris. Today's program was engineered by Ernst Carroll. Our technical producer is Steve Warnowskis. The program is produced by Allison Cuddy and Delia Lloyd. The senior producer of Odyssey is Joshua Andrews. Odyssey is a production of Chicago Public Radio under general manager Tori Malatia. I'm Gretchen Halfrich. Join us again next time for Odyssey.